Steiner for um, the Faculty of Extension. I'm with Leo, the Learning Engagement Office. Roar. And um, the one thing I'd like to get out of today's session is to have an opportunity to talk to you about active and engaged learning and how that might uh, make some uh, changes to your more traditional lecture discussion kind of classroom. Carrie? And I'm Carrie Rasmussen, and I'm the lead educational researcher in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. And I'm actually really excited to be here because I'm doing some research projects with a couple of faculty members on active learning. Uh, and one key one, which I'll keep talking about, so I'm going to apologize right now, but I just love what she's doing, is she's an oral pathologist, which means she talks about both cancer, which most dentists don't really get into. And she's made these seminars so active and so engaging that the reviews and the amount of learning that's happening has been phenomenal. So she actually won a national award last year for her active learning classroom. So I will use her for a few examples, but free, feel free to ask me any questions, and that's me. Okay, so let's take a couple of minutes to just well, go around the room quite quickly. Tell us your name, where you work, uh, maybe what you do at Extension, and one thing you'd like to get out of today's session. Nicole? But I'm currently developing uh, the third course, the three-part risk management theory. Um, and then I'll also be one of the instructors delivering the course as well. So today I'd like to learn how to make my delivery not so boring. Um, I can be a boring presenter, so, and how to engage them and bring research into what, what it is that I do. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Noreen Chuck. I uh, am professionally with interior design consultant, primarily on institutional and commercial projects. And uh, is with the Faculty of Extension, I teach uh, in the residential interiors program, primarily color. Oh, okay. I'm Peter Lomi. I work also work for the government of Alberta in um, learning and development, workplace learning. And uh, I teach uh, human resource foundations, and I'm always interested in uh, ways to um, actively engage students. Okay. I'm Kyle Whitfield, and um, I'm a faculty member here in the Faculty of Extension. I uh, teach face-to-face, uh, -face, I teach online, and um, I'm hoping to find ways to create excitement in those, both of those environments, uh, whatever that means. Excellent. Hi, I'm Judy Forrest. I teach the business analysis um, citation course here. And um, wow, I'm always looking to learn and engage and uh, yeah, learn new teaching methods and yeah, learn about the students. Okay. Kim? Oh, uh, my name is Kim Gibson. I'm the newest member of the Learning Engagement Office. And uh, I come from an education background. I mostly taught in elementary school. So today, I suppose, I want to reinforce my pedagogy and see what the experts have to say about that. Uh, I'm Alex. My answer is very similar to Kim's. I'm also with the Learning Engagement Office. And yeah, I'm interested to see, what, I guess, what uh, the entire have to say today. Okay. And who's online with us today? Uh, online, we have Evelyn and uh, Sean David Carter, both whom are very quiet at the moment. Okay. Know if they have anything to say. Well, hello to both of them. And if they want to introduce themselves, um, just tell them to, or I'll tell them to uh, type a few things, and we'll come back to Alex. I'm Helen Bedell. I'm an adjunct professor in the Extension. Yeah, I'm Helen Bedell. I'm an adjunct professor in the Extension. Working out the Dean's office, and my role is to handle most of the academic integrity issues that occur in the battery. So any insights into teaching is very helpful for my portfolio. <laughs> Excellent. I'm Don Mason. I'm with the English Language School. We're always looking for new ways to reinvigorate programming, particularly the interest in people learning how to make grammar in life. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Hansai with the government of Alberta, a senior uh, assignment environmental engineer, and I teach a couple of courses of work in environmental science assessment and education technologies. I'm here to learn about the non traditional teaching ways and making the class more exciting and uh, making the students more responsible for their own uh, education and achieving their own goals. Okay. I'm Sharon, and I'm a course instructor, and I teach leading strategic planning in advanced um, certificate of leadership. And 
We'll see if we can uh, add some spice to the classroom today. Um, the first thing that I just want to do is go through the key overview. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. And from Sean Carter, uh, a planner with the city of Chestermere. I help teach the online rural environments course last year, and I'd like to learn more about teaching. Ah, excellent. Welcome, Sean. OK. So um, the key overview, key outcomes for uh, today's session, we're going to define what active learning is, describe several techniques. In fact, we have more techniques than I think we have time. But luckily for you, we've also got links and videos and a few other things embedded in the PowerPoints. So if it turns out to be something that uh, we don't quite get to, um, we have some options for you to, uh, to follow up. Um, experience several active learning sessions and discuss the implementation of active learning in your teaching practice. So I'd like this to be a, a conversation as well as, as, a, as a lecture. So the very first thing that I'm going to have uh, Carrie work through with you is define active learning. Yeah, so I'm going to, I think we should do a caveat first is the whole point of active learning is you guys don't get just to sit here for an hour and listen to us because that would not be a good way to mentor or show you how to do active learning. So some of the stuff we're going to do, you have to actually engage in. So I don't apologize right now, because the first thing we're going to do is actually have you look at something. Um, so the first thing we want to do is kind of see what you think active learning is before we give you an official research definition. And that way we can keep our conversation going reflecting what your kind of initial thoughts were. So individually, and I'm going to time this, kind of. I'll, I'll time it. You're going to time it? I'll time okay, it. So Diana will time, officially. One minute, I want you to think about how you would define active learning by yourself. So there's paper around, so so when my free. One minute, what you think active learning is. Do we have some additional paper? There's yeah. paper here if you need a sheet. Ah, excellent. I'm not even sharing happening, that's awesome. All right, everybody, I'm going to hit the timer now. I feel no pressure. And there's no right or wrong. Good point. There is no right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. We have 32 seconds. Yeah, I really shortened it. <laughs> okay, timer's going to go off in about 13 seconds. So just before we tar start the next step, I'm going to tell you one of the hardest things for active learning is when you actually have students working is to not keep talking. So I stood there and I wanted to say a million things to you, but you actually have to pull back and give your learners a chance to actually engage without you first. So the next stage is, in groups of two or three, so however it works, where you're sitting, I want you guys to talk about your definitions and come up with a single definition of what active learning is. All right, you ready? Uh, three minutes starts now. Oh, I think that's Hi. 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 Uh, I said, uh, students and students yeah. in the next few years, they do discuss for a little bit of a Do relate to the next few years. 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 Do relate
discuss. Discuss relation. Oh, I, I can. Yes. Oh, I, can. <laughs> I, I said it was off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we only had a minute. Uh, I said it was a process of receiving information and transforming it into skills and understanding of how it's used in real life. Activity based. Same process. So it's um, grounded in practice and then reflection. Perfect. Reflection and practice. Reflection. So I think of. Uh, yeah, I think of uh, acquisition and then practice. We're at one minute, 30 seconds. Uh, and I guess active word maybe try to combine them. I don't think that practice. If you think of a word like a swim, you don't learn to swim. No, 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 I love it. Yeah. Or, or reading about yeah. research yeah. about it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so yeah. even yeah. things like soft skills are working together. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think you can use that to use practice learning also for acquisition. To some extent, just because people are not aware of things. Should be fun. Yeah. 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 I mean, that alarm is my morning wake up alarm. I can't believe you chose that. Sorry. Okay, so what we're going to do now is have uh, uh, is have each group sort of report back with to sort of your idea of active learning. Uh, Carrie will facilitate that, and I'll do some writing. Excuse the spelling. I am a spell tech girl. And again, there's actually not a right or wrong answer. And if you ever really want to get into educational research, this is probably not the way for me to spell it. Is that they're still arguing about the definition. So if we get four or five different definitions, we're exactly where the experts are right now. And they're still arguing about what it really means. So back table, what did you guys think active learning actually meant? Well, we had, um, we had kind of a multi-pronged approach, but um, in bullet points is that um, people are, students are actively involved, uh, that they have the opportunity to critique for relevance and uh, critique or analyze for relevance and um, and then it's problem centered so they have something real life to work with it's not um, some conceptual unless you're teaching concepts but um, <laughs> for the most part it's real life and it's um, related to having some problem just as we did our problem was to Fine. In a group, yeah. which is more difficult. Okay. So, next table. Right. I was just going to say, come up with a talk. Students are engage via inquiry, inquiry based activities to experience the next one in there. Inquiry based activities, what was the last one? Um, and therefore, they learn. Okay. Um, so I we describe or type of active learning as student engaged learning. We saw the role of the student and the instructor as being of equal importance. This involved the three probably the approach needed to be a guy on the side rather than the stage on the stage. <laughs> Um, there, I 
say there's two elements with ours. Some of the things that they do, uh, so I guess those would be, those would be uh, um, signals of it or whatever, which is uh, they're doing, discussing, relating, reflecting. Um, and with the piece that you and they have to receive the information. The, yeah, they have transform to transform it. Receive the information and transform it. And but I think the the piece that's different than we've heard before is Kyle's piece, which is that if there's, if there's a research based, that it uh, there's evidence. There's the evidence learning that takes some place. learning takes place. Yeah, because you can have all kinds of activities activities that are fun, but not no learning takes place. Right. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm teaching, how do I know you've learned something? Yeah. Like we had, had an instructor trainer along many years ago, and she brought cookies and everything else, and everybody loved her class, but somebody sat in and said, I don't think anybody's learning anything here. <laughs> Le learning how to be a nice person. Yeah, yeah. Do we have something over here? Decided on a learning through interacting So you do have a similar theme with some different categories. So the nice thing is all of those can be part of active learning. So the one thing with active learning I found is go and find something that works for your content. So like you said, unless you're teaching concepts. So I've actually seen somebody do some sort of active learning on very much fundamental knowledge translation. And but that works for that material, for that course, for those learners. And there's a lot of different little tools you can pick and you can merge them. So my recommendation really quickly is pick what works for your circumstance and don't just pick one. The one that I told you that we're doing research right now on that she won the award last year, she's using five different techniques in a course of a half, well, it's basically a three hour seminar. And so she's picked up, she does the storytelling, she does what we're doing right here, which I'll tell you what it's called right away. She does case-based learning. So there's a whole bunch of things happening within that three hours because it worked. She even has a little bit of, she called it gamification. I was arguing with her that it quite wasn't, but she's got a wild card scenario that she throws in the middle. And, and they love it and they're really learning. Admission? Uh, no, just like okay. And the second thing is with active learning is you have to explain quite often to the students that you're not just going to stand up in front and talk. Because if that's what they're used to, depending on what program you're in, if that's actually what they're expecting when they walk in, you're going to have a little culture shock happen when you start making them do things. Because they're going to, especially, like if it was me in 7 o'clock at night and I worked all day, I might be going, oh my god, I'm so tired, I just came here to listen for an hour. Like she's going to actually make me, or he's going to make me talk and think. Maybe talk is really the bad one. So you have to make it very much not threatening and explain to them that it's a technique that will actually allow them to learn and retain for a lot longer because that's what the evidence has shown and that's what people are actually experiencing. So there's a way you have to bring them in or they won't like it at first. Okay? And that's also with online. If you're starting to make them work with groups and do all sorts of things, although you have to spread the timeline out, you can do many of these things and mimic the same pattern. It's just you can't all do it in three hours, right? Yeah. But you have to explain to them that there's a benefit because otherwise they're going to go, oh, why do I have to? Why do I have to go into the discussion three times? Right? So instructions and, and why are and key. Why, yeah, absolutely. Or you'll be like me when I went to my master's online in the first three months. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not learning anything. They're just making me talk to people which I was a computer programmer, was not good for me. And it wasn't until I actually went for my first job interview and could answer every question they asked me about instructional design that I realized that I was remembering everything they had talked about. But it took me about three months to believe what they were saying. So it's just something to keep in mind. So let's go to the next. So we're actually doing a systematic review on active learning right now in healthcare. So we've done quite a bit of research on what active learning is, which is why I can tell you that they're not agreeing. So we went in and looked at everything and came up with this definition. Active learning is the use of meaningful activities. So that's what some of you were saying. It can't just be fun, right? It has to be meaningful. It has to actually reflect what you're teaching. In the classroom, and I, it doesn't matter whether the classroom is a face-to-face -face or an online classroom, quite often what changes is the amount of time that it takes and the 
instruction. We also have blended classrooms here at Extension, so this would work well as well as well with that because with you have some time face to face, and you have then have some time online in between the time that you're meeting. And then really exactly what you all said, it has to engage the students in the learning process. They actually have to be an active member, the whole point of active learning. And it gives the students some control, so you also have to be willing to let things go sideways every once in a while and guide them back when they go too far. Because you're asking them to do something, sometimes it's not going to be exactly what you thought that hour was going to look like, and you also have to be a little bit reflective and responsive to them. Yeah. And this is also true of a series of things um, in the sense that um, you can do this and, and do it quite effectively in a fairly basic way. You can do it quite effectively in a very complex way. So even if you were doing some of these things now and you're saying to yourself, okay, I've, I've done those things, you can actually increase the complexity. You can bump it up several levels and in fact get it quite complex. Um, so I've done this uh, with undergraduate students, I've done this with non-students, like adults in a, in a workshop setting, and I've also done this with graduate students. So it, it, the level in which you do it and the focus in which you do it can change depending on your audience and your content, but fundamentally the principles underlying them stay the same. Just another question, how are we going to get the copy of this? Yes, the question that was asked, and I'm going to be repeating the questions because we have a couple of people online who don't always hear our audience. Uh, yes, the question was, are we going to be getting access to these in the uh, slides? And the answer is yes. At the end of this uh, session, in the next few days, we will post uh, both the, uh, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to listen to it again. Second thing you'll get is a copy of the slides, and the third thing you'll get are the handouts and you'll be able to sort of uh, use those as well. So we've got it covered, I hope. All right. So what we just did is one type of active learning. It's something called Think, Pair, Share. So how many of you have ever heard of, so a couple people are saying yes or putting their hands up. This is really nice. So I could explain to you all the theory behind the fact that this actually helps with retention, that if you actually do this, it's very non-threatening by the end. You've likely got a better definition than you started with. Once you get into more advanced and adult learning, it really shows the collaboration and the ability to do more than it's as a single individual because you constantly are building, right? So it's going from you as a single person to two or three people to a whole group. And what you start to see is things evolve, right? So at the end, there's a much more rigorous answer quite often than what happens at the beginning. And this is really good, I've noticed, for like, language acquisition, where they can start to see that doing it individually, they are not going to get as far. But one, it's also not threatening because it's step by step by step. And there's never a right or wrong answer. It's always about building the knowledge. Yes. Um, I agree with you. Uh, one of the critiques that I have had from students about think, pair, share is um, or them talking to each other is, we're just talking to each other. We, we don't know anything about the expert, about the expert topic, or about the topic. You're the expert. You should be talking to us. What do we know? So it's, it's like this reverse. But so that's that expectation. Can, can I just repeat that yeah. question? Oh, um, just simply wanted to, uh, the, the uh, Kyle suggested that some of the students that she's worked with in the past have thought that um, they should not be talking to each other because they're non-experts. They should only be listening to the instructor who is the expert, in their opinion. Go ahead. Yes. I, I do an exercise at the beginning of my course. It's an HR course. Everybody works. Everybody's an expert. And I give them a challenge. And then when they, they come up with the answers, I say uh, that those are really good answers. You might as well go home now because we just covered half the course. Right. So that it validates that they actually bring something right. to it. And I'd like to, I'd like to actually do a little bit of a response to Kyle's uh, thinking on this and or your experience with, with introducing this. I think part of it is how you introduce it. I think part of it is how you set it up so that you get students to understand that they bring something to the table. And unless you are sort of priming them over time that they are valued for their opinion and valued for their thinking, it might be novice thinking at this point, but it doesn't nonetheless have a place in the conversation. 
because if you in traditional education you scaffold so you find out where the baseline is and you start to build on that from their perspective so with think pair share one of the ways of dealing with that is by having students understand the value of their own experience within the process and the conversation that will then allow you to move it into the next level and potentially get them to come to the conclusion of their own knowledge is is actually more valuable and further along than they actually thought. Yeah, and I think um, for us as educators, the other thing to, to remember is that if they actually start putting their own experience and context into the learning, they're going to remember it much better and in a way that actually reflects in their practice yeah. than if we just are didactic. And I use this model online as well. So uh, most of my teaching has been online uh, over the last 15 or so years. And fundamentally, uh, I will get that on occasion, or have gotten that on occasion, where a student will call, um, you know, call or email and say, you know, um, we're all talking to each other, but you have, you know, we're waiting for you. And that I usually send them a note at the very, very beginning of a class when I've taught in the past, and I've said, um, here's, what I teach on my hands. I teach sitting on my fingers. So this is about finding out what you know. This is about trying to figure out how that ties into the content. It figure, it's all about you making conversation with other experts and novices in the group and having a conversation. And then I guide that. So that comes back to this concept of guide on the side, um, as opposed to, because I've discovered, and I think in your classrooms you'll have discovered the same thing, if you actually start to answer every single question that exists, they will never talk to each other. They will only talk to you. Because you have established yourself as the expert. And by being the expert, there is no other conversation to be had. They're there to learn only from you. Whereas, in fact, if you take all of the people in the room and put all their expertise together, it's amazing what you can find. So the principles, bottom line principles of active learning. So, and I think you covered most of them in these, uh, in these definitions that you came up with. Um, so well done. Purposeful, purposive, the relevance of the task to the learner's concerns. It has to have a purpose. I need to know why I'm interested in, I, I'm not just interested in doing this, jumping through this hoop for this hoop's purpose. I need to know why you're doing it, tell me. And this is especially true of adult learners. Um, they, uh, but I find in K-12 that they're very interested as well. I mean, you know, you've always got a class of, of students and, and, and many of them want to know why. Why do I need to know algebra? I'll never have to do that when I'm 30. And then you think to yourself, okay, how do I tie this to something that's relevant that, in fact, will allow them to recognize that this algebra is, in, is required? It needs to be reflective, so I have to think about what I've done. Negotiated, we have to talk about how to negotiate the learning, because you may come with a very clear view of the world in your, in your perspective, and I may need to try and modify that a little bit. You may come with no view of the world, expect me to know everything. We need to modify that a little bit. We need to talk it through. Critical. Learners appreciate the different ways and means of learning within that context. It's important that the critical thinking components come out. So it's not just memorization and regurgitation, but it's <coughs> literally looking at something from a critical perspective. Almost thinking less about 2D and thinking 3D. How do I shift? this ball around so that I see the other side of it, so that I can see the context of it from all angles. The complexity. Learners compare learning tasks with complexities existing in real life and make reflective analysis. So Carrie talked about her um, award-winning instructor using case studies, for example. And we use them all the time. The question you have to ask is, are you using them in an active way? Because it can be quite passive to hand out a case study, have somebody write a paper, hand it back. It's a relatively passive process. Whereas, is there a way of turning the case study into an authentic real life? Can you turn the case of, of a court case, turn, turn it into a jury setting? Can you do role playing? Are there other ways that you can actively engage your, your students to create the complex uh, connections to their world? So when uh, you talk about your focus is color, we think about the complexity of color. Different people see different colors at different places. How do we make a case study on some design piece that you want to do actually active as opposed to individual silos of knowledge? Situation driven. So it needs the situation to be considered in order to establish the learning test. So sometimes case study works really well, but sometimes you get a class where case study is not the appropriate learning engagement. 
So what do you do with that? How do you do what they call in instructional design um, reactive learning or, um, um, oh, I've forgotten the word. It's a uh, um, um, immediate design. So it's literally designing on your feet. You're sitting in the classroom. You're working with the students. You can see the blank faces. You know there's something wrong. <gasps> How do I fix it? And I need to fix it now. Like, I can't go home and think about it. I need to write, do it right this minute. And then engagement, how do you engage them with real life tasks that are reflected in the activities and get them to really see the connections? Because it's all fine and good to do this in the lab, because that's what this is, it's a lab. And then we take it outside and we go, and I have had students come back to me and say, I want my money back. Excuse me? Well, you taught me how to be a K-12 teacher. It's nothing like the real classroom. I want my money back. Because we spent a lot of time on nice theories and wonderful ideas, sent them out into the classroom with like real people who really wanted to know things. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that can backfire a little bit. OK, so another approach for active learning, and, and this may sound more like a different way of actually talking, but if you do stories the right way, it becomes very active. So storytelling. So there's a lot of uh, research happening in more and more, and especially as we look at indigenous pedagogy, storytelling is actually fundamental in how they approach teaching and learning. And I would say they probably take the teaching off to say learning. And, but it really, really can help with an active classroom and with that critical thinking and that linking, because it can bring in not only your own experience. So my son's active actually just started graduate school here. And the one thing he said to me is, he came home one day, and this is like three years into a science degree, and said, one of my professors actually talked about his research. It was so cool. And he went, instead of complaining to me, which is what he did on a regular basis, he explained what was happening, what the research was, how that tied to what they were learning. And he said, how come they don't all tell us what they do? So us actually trying to stop that sometimes is not a good thing because that provides context and that's really where our expertise comes best is when we try to tell stories. We also get past those silos that Diane was talking about. So I work with faculty in medicine and dentistry and one of our biggest things is to stop them from thinking about the symptoms and the diagnosis and actually think about the person as a lot of person, potentially with family members that what they're doing is actually impacting the whole. And so with telling a story about something, so I'm going to give you a really quick example. There, there's one, and she does very much this big picture on diagnosis. So they go in and they say, this is what I saw, this is what it should happen, this is how we should maintain. And it was a pretty bad story. The guy ended up with cancer. Right? So first of all, it's a real story, she gets permission. So there's nothing made up. So they know this is a real human being. Then she starts talking about the fact he has three kids and he wanted to go home for Christmas and would you let him go home? And they all went, nope, which is really serious, you can't go home for Christmas. So she keeps telling the story. Well, really, he's not going to get in until January. Would you stop him from going home? And then they start talking, well, you know, maybe we should let him go home and see him. And they actually go past their, especially when they're learning, right? They go past the facts and they start thinking about repercussions and the critical thinking. The other thing with storytelling is that, again, especially for, well, I think all the way through, but I know for adults that are dealing with so much every day, it helps them remember. So I had to sit in a biochem class a few years ago, and I'm not a biochemist. I was actually helping create a blended course out of it. And the only thing I remember three years later is that there is a cycle where they just waste energy, and then bumblebees use it to warm up in the morning. So there's actually a purpose for this cycle, and I can explain it, and I can draw it, I sat in hours of biochem where it was all facts and what was happening, but she told that story about that bumblebee, and I remember the whole cycle. So if you can do that, if you can find ways and allegories, and just with neuroscience, because I'm a researcher, so I'm really sorry, but with the research on how our brains work, things like stories and humor actually causes those synapses to happen way easier than just memorizing. So a story that has a little bit of funny or some personal tidbits really will impact the learning. And it makes it active because they start engaging in that story. Right? Okay. All right. So the next one we're going to talk about here is concept or mind mapping. Who's actually uh, done concept or mind mapping? Okay. A few of you. 
So fundamentally, uh, concept mapping was developed by Joseph Novak. Um, and, and it is the idea of creating a visual of the concepts. I've been a visual learner my whole life. I think that's part of the reason why I do a lot of artwork and I do a lot of, uh, of sort of, of um, text, te tactile things. And um, some people are reflective learners and some people are, are, um, are doers and so on. But no matter how you focus on your learning, one of the ways that really sort of seems to help solidify is through the whole idea of concept. A high, high, I knew I was going to get this word. A hierarchical form of structure, a diagram that illustrates conceptual knowledge. So it's basically this. So if you think about cats, then you've got cats. They have four legs, they're mammals, they're, they're uh, family pets, short hair, long hair, all the concepts that are around cats. And then you start to expand those concepts out into, well, short hairs are generally a British cat, or long hairs can be a Persian cat, or um, the flexible spines can mean they can jump and climb. So all of a sudden you're starting to expand this view of what a cat looks like. So when you want to create a concept map, and I've used concept maps in the past as a, um, a precursor to a major project. So I've actually had students as part of an assignment create a concept <coughs> map and give it to me, or a group would create a concept map and give it to me. It allows me to see their thinking. It allows me to see how they tie the concepts together. It gives me an opportunity to sort of play with um, some of the ideas that they have. And also it allows me to sort of say things like, if you work on this concept, it is a 20-year project. So if you work on this concept, it's something you can accomplish in the three weeks we have with each other or the three days or the one hour or whatever. So fundamentally, it's leveraging logical thinking through the concept mapping and at the same time improving the balance between creativity and logical thinking. So you're actually trying to get students to engage in this sort of uh, view of the world through these mapping. I actually was going to use this as one of our little exercises today and I thought, mm, this, is, this might not be a good one, simply because we only have an hour. This, I, I could do an hour to two hours on concept mapping alone. But if you think about it, even in a classroom setting, pencil and a piece of paper, that's all you need. Two or three people in a group. You could have created a concept map doing this. So your very first concept would be uh, active learning, and you would have created your centerpiece and your, and your outside pieces that are all connected to each other. Then I would have said, OK, form groups. Concept map. You would have taken all of that information and put it into one big concept map. And then as a class, we would have taken it and moved it into a bigger concept. So we would have taken all of the components and all the pieces, <coughs> negotiated the knowledge, negotiated the structure, put it all together, and, and created a concept map for this particular course. So concept maps, they encourage uh, collaborative learning. So, and collaborative learning is one of the core tenets of active learning and a team knowledge. So it really pinpoints team knowledge, really gets folks to, uh, when they're in groups or when they're in teams, to actually physically um, start to think about each other. It allows deep learning, because even folks who don't reflect well can concept map quite deeply. So it sometimes will take someone who says, well, I'm not a big reflective thinker, I'm a doer, I just want to do it. Like, give me the information, let me go do it. OK, well, do this. Put it in a concept map. And all of a sudden, they, are, they have that sort of added reflection that they're not even thinking about, but it's actually creating that situation. Um, a picture tells a thousand words, so it gives a graphical representation of what's easier to understand. It's an active assessment, so it allows you to assess the, what they're learning. and to uh, So active uh, concept mapping for uh, a final would be, in my opinion, quite an interesting way to see what they've learned, what they haven't learned in terms of a, of a final assessment, um, or certainly a midterm assessment. Um, students can find it intimidating, so there are some downsides to concept mapping. They can, so you need to, to bring them along. You need to show them examples. You need to get them to do smaller examples. You need to perhaps get them to work in pairs or teams so that the um, the amount of time that it's taken to put this together is, is less onerous on one person and, and they can rely on others when they start to feel like they don't know something. Um, 
Concept mapping is also often not graded, which is a disadvantage, although I have, as I said, I've actually done that. Um, but it can be a way of getting a quick assessment. So at the end of the day, you could say to your class, I want you to do a concept map on this topic. We have 10 minutes. Form groups of three. And, all, and, and hand it in at the end. And it becomes part of their participation, but it also becomes a way for you to judge whether or not you need to do a little bit more at the next class on some topic, because on that topic, because it's see, it, there's a gap, there's a missing component. Okay. Um, so I think that's, I do have a, sorry, go ahead. So just before you change the screen, yep. the other nice thing is if you want to take it on and actually show them how to do one first and do it just as part of, of a conversation, so if you have a discussion happening. So let's say we got through all this, and I don't know if any of you have it, but I know a guy who has a hairless cat, the ugliest things I've ever seen, but he likes this little hairless cat. How hard would it be for me to add that based on our discussion to oh. this concept? Easy. Easy, right? What if I had written the narrative, or I had a, a paragraph that we had for how hard would it be? So people will stop actually adding, right? If you actually have them doing a long form narrative when they're first starting to think about things, there's a couple things. Number one, they're not going to want to add that, because that's a huge amount of work, even if it's on a computer and they're having to go in and just add it. That's, that, that's not nearly as easy, but they've started to own it. And I don't know if you know, but once they own something, you have them hand something in that they think is 100% done, mm -hmm. there's a lot less learning going to happen after that than when it's organic. So you can actually get them to build without having any of those barriers go down that we all have, right? Someone says, how can you, how, how close are you to this getting this, journal, this paper ready for the journal? I said, I'm about 80% we're ready to submit. And they're like, you're 80% you're ready? I said, yes, because I know they're going to ask I can't say 100% because I'm going to get mad when I get the list of yeah. things. How many so, papers never go further? Yeah, like because, oh my god, nobody can say anything bad about this. But if you think about it, we're all like that. So this is a very organic way to start a conversation about a concept without anybody starting to put those walls up. Probably even us, right? Because if we had this all planned out, it's so beautiful. And someone said, what about a short hair or a no hair? And you went, oh. Yeah, change all my handouts. This is a pretty nice, reflective way. And as Carrie points out, it can be used in, two, in both those ways. You can use it at the beginning to create the concept, to introduce it, but you to brainstorm it. But you can also use it as a way of assessing their knowledge of a concept that you've spent the day working on. For example. So I've got a very quick little video. Hi, I'm Alex for Teach Like This, and this is Concept Mapping. Concept Map visually illustrates the relationship between concepts and ideas. Concepts are most often represented in circles or boxes. And they're linked by words and phrases to explain the connection between the ideas. This helps students organize their thoughts, discover new relationships, and further understand information. Most concept maps represent a hierarchical structure. The overall broad concept is first, followed by subtopics. Concept mapping provides several purposes for a learner. It encourages students to discover new concepts and new relationships, helps students brainstorm and generate new ideas, it helps students integrate new concepts with old concepts, it allows students to more clearly communicate their ideas, and students gain an enhanced knowledge of their concept and allows them to make further evaluations. I've used concept maps in my teaching when writing persuasive essays. Students start with the main thesis, then they get their supporting information, and underneath that get their evidence. This work done ahead of time makes the writing much more organized and their argument much more persuasive. To build a concept map, start with the main idea, then determine key concepts, and finish by connecting those concepts by using words and phrases. That's all for this video. If you have additional questions, connect with me on Twitter, by email, by commenting down below, and subscribe to see weekly strategies in your newsfeed. I'm Alex, and that's Teach Like This. Nice. All right. That was Alex, and he teaches like that. Slow it down. Uh, yeah, he tends to talk a little quickly, doesn't he? All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about, I think Carrie's going to talk a little bit about gamification. 
Um, okay, so again, it's something that everybody in, uh, at least in the research area, is still arguing about what it actually means. But what we're going to do is, I'm going to talk about something called gamification as a to game club. So I'm not talking about bringing game in and then just use it as a game and somehow that becomes a gamified because that doesn't really work. You have to actually transform a game to fit what you're actually trying to teach. So I'll give you some examples, but hopefully that makes sense. So gamification allows um, for you to bring in elements that would work. So at the end of the day, and it doesn't matter who you are, there's something or some type of game that you find fascinating or engaging. So it's about building engagement. In some cases, it could be competitive. In some cases, it could be wanting to uh, actually, like badges or points, which is one of these, where you actually want to earn things. So the check mark people really like to earn points or badges, right? There's a whole bunch of things, and again, it depends on your classroom. So we're doing some really cool research right now with dental hygiene, because it's, there's only one male, and it's all pretty much a female class. They don't like the competition at all, except for the one male in that class. He's just in to win. The rest of them are much more about getting the next, like getting all the points. So we want to do some research on is, is, if it's actually a gender thing or if we've just got one competitive guy and a bunch of kind of, as long as I get my stuff done, you do in the class, just this one. So one is, allow them to have multiple paths. So give them the chance to actually work on different cases and have different results and then compare them. So if you actually had everyone do this exact same case and there were five different paths that they went on, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That could be five alternate scenarios, which we all have. But when we teach, we quite often give them one. And then we wonder why our students, when they graduate, go, well, there's one way to do this. Well, because we've given them one way, right, to do this. So we can't actually expect them to think that I could have done it this way, or this way, or this way. I don't know about you, but the biggest heebie-jeebies I ever get in a class before they actually know me is I'll say, well, it depends. And they're like, you mean it depends. There has got to be that one answer, right? So allow them to have control over their path, and they all don't have to have the same experience. Bring in characters and story. I am not a role play person, so I'm going to just tell you that right now. I know that works in some scenarios. I hate role play. Online, I love role play. If I have an online course, I can role play like you wouldn't believe. But in a face to face class, I get all like, yeah. So online quite often will actually be a much better place for more introverted people to engage in a role-playing activity. And it's quite amazing. I've seen where we put people in pros and cons to um, it's either going to be a park or a little income housing. You've never seen a debate like that online. Oh my gosh, we had to shut it down. We're getting very passionate. Okay? And they weren't even, that wasn't what they thought when they walked in, right? Awesome for a debate. Because the people who I'd said, oh, I don't care, were also very passionate about keeping it as X or Y. Opportunities for mastery. So I, this goes way past. So people shouldn't just get one kick at a cat. They should actually be allowed to repeat and repeat and repeat if there's time, and that's okay, until they hit a point of mastery. I have one lady, and she teaches at uh, Blue Valley, and she basically has set up a whole course in a gamified where if they don't quite get it right, they have up to three times to increase their grade. And then they have all these different points that they can score. They're going in with honors for their final, and they're still writing. Like, they actually won't get any more better grades with their final. They're still going in to write, see where they are in the rankings. The, the amount of engagement she has in a course that she had no engagement on five years ago is amazing. Give them points, badges, and leaderboards if it makes sense. Okay. I'm in faculty of medicine and dentistry. They're very competitive people. They love this. They want to be first. To the point where I'm like, maybe we shouldn't put leaderboards in because they always want to be first. They're very competitive. Mm. But think about what you want. It's a leaderboard. I'm sorry. That's it's actually. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say it's a list. So Diane's first. Kyle, a oh, second. Okay. It's yeah. the actual. It's the scoreboard that keeps track of who's actually at the top of the game. So I can have six or seven scenarios, like as a group you have to do this, whoever posts this 